Molecular polarity is one of the most important factors determining a compound's physical properties and how it interacts with its environment. Let me start with a simple example of the impact of molecular polarity in our world. This is a list of several simple elements and compounds and their boiling points. Now notice that the boiling points are all well below zero degrees Celsius. This indicates that they are actually found as gases under normal ambient conditions. Notice as well that there's a relationship between the boiling point of each substance and that substance's molecular or atomic mass. The smaller the molecule, the lower the boiling point. Another way of saying this is that the smaller the molecule, the less energy is needed to get it to move from the liquid to the gas phase. And that's why larger molecules tend to be liquids and solids at ambient temperatures, while smaller molecules are more likely to be gases. Let's add one more substance to our list, water. Now water is a tiny molecule. It falls between helium and neon in terms of size, but its boiling point is well above any of these other substances. That's great for us because our life and our survival depends on water in the liquid form. But how could this be? Why is water a liquid under ambient conditions while carbon dioxide, a molecule that's over twice its size, is a gas? The answer, of course, lies in molecular polarity. Water is a very polar molecule. Carbon dioxide is not. So what does it mean for a molecule to be polar? Molecular polarity reflects an uneven electron distribution over the structure of a molecule that results in the development of a permanent dipole. A dipole is the separation of charge into poles or regions of partial positive and negative in an overall neutral molecule. Here's an example. Hydrogen chloride is another polar molecule the chlorine atom in this pairing is much more electronegative than the hydrogen. And remember that electronegativity is a measure of an atom's ability to pull bonding electrons towards itself. So the two shared electrons between hydrogen and chlorine are much closer to the chlorine than they are to the hydrogen. Add to this the fact that chlorine has three sets of lone pairs on it, while hydrogen has none, and we see that the electron density on the chlorine atom is much higher than on the hydrogen atom. And the greater the electron density is on chlorine, um, this results in a partial negative charge developing relative to the hydrogen. Because the molecule is neutral overall, this also means that the hydrogen must have a partial positive charge. In other words, it develops a dipole, or a separation of charge over the molecule. There are a couple of ways of indicating this polarization. One is to use these delta symbols. This is the lowercase Greek symbol for delta, and we use it with positives and negatives to in indicate partial positives and partial negatives. Another way is to use a vector to indicate both the direction and magnitude of electron pull. So the arrow here shows that the electrons are drawn more strongly to the chlorine atom, and the hydrogen is left with a partial positive charge as a result. The length of the arrow, when drawn carefully, can indicate the degree of separation of charge. Longer arrows mean a larger partial charge separation or more polarization. Ultimately, these ve vectors indicate what we call the dipole moment. And a dipole moment is a measure of the extent of net charge separation in a dipole. Now, we've introduced the concept of polar bonds already. As a quick review, in pure covalent bonds, there is a small difference in electronegativity between the two atoms that are bound together. As a result, electrons are shared more equally, and no dipole develops. This is also known as a nonpolar bond.
In a polar bond, however, there is a larger difference in electronegativity between the two atoms that are bound together. Not so large that it becomes an ionic bond and, and one of the electrons is transferred completely, but large enough so that the electrons are shared unequally. The larger difference results in the formation of a dipole. And the strength of the dipole moment largely depends on the magnitude of the difference in electronegativity between the atoms. But bond polarity is actually only one small part of the picture. It only applies when you have two atoms involved. When three or more atoms are involved, we discuss molecular polarity. This reflects the interaction of individual bond polarities within the molecule and the molecule's geometry. Okay, so let's take a look at how this works for carbon dioxide and water. Both of these molecules actually contain polar bonds. The electronegativity differences between carbon and oxygen and carbon dioxide are 1.0. That falls within the range for a polar bond. For hydrogen and oxygen and water, it's 1.4, which is also well within the range for a polar bond. So we can actually draw um, these bond dipoles as vectors pointing towards the more electronegative atom in each combination. Now to determine molecular polarity, we actually have to determine how those bond dipole moments, those individual vectors interact with each other over the entire molecule because molecular polarity refers to the electron distribution over the entire molecule. And this is actually vector addition. It's not just a simple addition of electronegativity values. It's a process that involves accounting for both the magnitude of the dipoles and their direction or angle. In other words, their molecular geometry. For our purposes, we don't need to do a strict calculation of how the vectors combine. We actually have some shortcuts that we can use to sort of visually determine what the results would be. So if the vectors are of equal magnitude, but pulling in opposite directions, they will cancel each other out. And that's the case with carbon dioxide. So the best analogy I have here is for a tug of war. Both oxygen atoms are trying to pull the shared electrons with carbon towards themselves. Now, if in a tug of war you have two equally matched teams that are pulling with the exact same strength in opposite directions, they're going to be at a standstill. The rope that they're pulling between them is not going to move. It's the same way for the electrons that are shared in the carbon dioxide molecule. If both oxygens are pulling electrons with the same strength towards themselves, but they're doing so at opposite angles, those electrons aren't going to move. And in order for a polar molecule to develop, you do have to have those electrons moving towards the more electronegative atom. They don't, so we say that we have an overall dipole moment equal to zero. So when you have equal bond dipoles pulling in opposite directions, they cancel each other out and you develop a nonpolar molecule. So polar bonds, nonpolar molecule. It's a little bit different for water. Our bond dipoles are equal in magnitude, but they're not pulling in opposite directions. Because of that bond angle associated with the water molecule, these vectors actually add together. They don't cancel each other out. And what we end up with is an overall dipole moment. So oxygen, as it's pulling those electrons away from the hydrogen, is not actually being balanced out by an equal but opposite pull in the other direction. So it wins the war for the electrons. The electrons move closer to oxygen. It develops a higher electron density and a partial negative charge as a result. The hydrogens develop partial positives and we have a polar molecule. And it's those partial positive and partial negatives on that water molecule that develop 
strong intermolecular attractions between the molecules that allow them to stay as a liquid at ambient temperatures. So in order for a molecule to be considered polar, there have to be two conditions. And both of these conditions must be met. First of all, there has to be at least one polar covalent bond. If all of the electrons throughout a molecule are being shared pretty equally, so all nonpolar bonds, then you're just not going to develop a polar molecule. So in order for a molecule to be polar, you have to have at least one polar bond within the molecule. Second, the molecule structure has to be such that the bond dipole moment for that polar covalent bond is not canceled out. Okay. Here are some guidelines for the process of predicting molecular polarity. First, start with the Lewis structure with the appropriate bond angles. And second, look for atoms with large electronegativity differences with their surrounding atoms, so greater than 0 0.4. This indicates that first condition that you have a polar bond present in the molecule. And one tip is that you're more likely to have that polar bond if you see an atom that comes from the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table. So elements like nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, all of these have higher electronegativities, which means that they are more likely to form polar bonds. So when I see them in a molecule, I know that I have a greater chance of this actually being a molecule with polar bonds. Before I can say whether that molecule is polar overall, though, I have to determine if the polar bonds cancel each other out, whether they're balanced or not. So there's a few conditions to consider when you're thinking about the balance of polarity. So first of all, you have to have multiple polar bond dipoles in order to balance. Second, those, those polar bonds have to be equal in magnitude, so equal in pooling strength for those electrons, and they have to be symmetrically arranged all the way around a central atom in the molecule. So symmetry in a three-dimensional molecule can be a little bit hard to visualize, but ultimately it means equal angles for those polar bonds all the way around that central atom. So let's apply these requirements to two different molecules. On the left, I have carbon tetrachloride. On the right, methyl chloride. These are the electronegativity values associated with the atoms in each of these molecules. And you can see that I do have one of those higher electronegativity atoms, chlorine, that can be associated with polarity. So um, I'm going to start looking for my polar bonds here. And sure enough, um, I do have uh, some electronegativity differences that are greater than 0 0.4, in particular between the carbon and the chlorine in each of these molecules. So I'll draw in that bond dipole, pointing towards the more electronegative atoms in each and that's the chlorine. So in carbon tetrachloride, each of those bond dipoles are actually pulling in opposite directions. I have four bond dipoles, so four different bonds. Those bond dipoles are all equal in magnitude because it's all chlorine attached to the carbon. So they're all pulling with the same exact strength. And even though it may not look like it from this two-dimensional representation, those bond dipoles are symmetrically arranged around that carbon atom. Remember that in three dimensions, our, our symmetry is going to be determined by whether or not we have equal bond angles for those polar bonds all the way around. And for a tetrahedral molecule, all of my bond angles are 109.5. Those are equal bond angles. This is considered a symmetrical bond arrangement for all of these polar bonds that are equal in magnitude. They cancel each other out. This means no overall dipole moment and we have a nonpolar molecule, even though we have polar bonds. In methyl chloride on the right, we have only the one chlorine carbon bond. Now there is a difference in electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen. 
It's 0 0.4, it's right on the edge between polar and nonpolar. Just as a general rule of thumb, when you see carbon and hydrogen bonds, those usually are associated with uh, nonpolar regions of a molecule. There's just not quite large enough of a difference in electronegativity. Um, but there is a little bit of a bond dipole associated with them, but it actually points from the hydrogen to the carbon because the carbon's the more electronegative one here. So our bond dipoles are not equal in magnitude or direction, really. Chlorine is pulling up, and then we've also got the hydrogen, which are, um, they're actually, uh, electrons are being pulled towards the carbon, so away from the opposite end of the molecule. The bond angles are all equal, but the magnitude of those bond dipoles and the direction are not. So symmetry is not present in this particular molecule in terms of those bond dipoles. We do end up with an overall dipole moment. We end up with a partial negative developing on that most electronegative atom in the molecule, which is chlorine, and a partial positive associated with the opposite side of that uh, molecule, which is associated with all of those different hydrogen atoms. So this is a polar molecule. So in summary, bond polarity is based only on the difference in electronegativities between the two atoms bound together. Molecular polarity, on the other hand, reflects the combination of those bond polarities and molecular shape. And it is possible for a molecule to have polar bonds and be considered a nonpolar molecule.